Hey guys, welcome back to another video article. Today I'm going to be focusing on celestial mechanics regarding the sun, the planet, and the influence of the machinery of the cosmos as the star travels around the galaxy and throughout the cosmos. So I just want to make this a brief video. I have made a couple of longer videos and I touched on this a little bit in some of the longer videos and I'm going to recap on that. And I want to really just focus on this video and I'm actually going to put a lot of graphics in this video so you can really see what I'm talking about. And we actually have uh, geological proof that what I'm talking about is real. The concept that I've been saying that motion of matter equals gravity, which equals energy. And then because of the quantum nature of the universe itself, uh, it equals plus about 10%. Now that 10% is not the part that I'm focusing on right now. Mainly we're focusing on the fact that motion of matter equals gravity, which equals energy plus, just plus. Okay. Now what that means, I'm going to break that down in very simple terms. And as I said, you can watch all my earlier videos where I've talked about the dark energy field and, uh, it's been called the Higgs field, the ether, the prana, the firmament, these are all different names for this liquid crystal medium that the universe is made out of. And all matter in the universe is moving over this liquid medium crystalline structure. And it's the motion over that, that or they, they've also called it zero point energy. It's the motion over the medium. It, and, and you can just call it space or space time as well. You can just call it the fabric of space time. So you can just say as, as planets, as stars, as people, uh, anything that moves through space, it increases its energy and that therefore it increases its mass. So it gets heavier. You've heard the term, the, the faster you move, the heavier you get. Well, that's absolutely true, not only on scales that we're used to as humans, but also on the cosmic scales. That concept is absolutely the truth. And the reason why I'm not going to break down in this talk, I'm not going to break down exactly the reason why for this uh talk just to keep things simplified and I've discussed this in my other videos and some other articles I've done if you're interested you can always look up the right side of dark energy a universal construct there's a uh, 30 article page uh, 30 articles that I've written on the subject and you can look at those and some of my other work but uh, just to keep things really simplified I want to focus right now on the idea that motion of matter equals gravity which equals energy plus about 10 percent okay but just plus so that means that as the sun is moving around the cosmos, the different stellar, you know, the, the cosmos itself influences the speed that the sun is moving. That means that the cosmos influences how fast and how slow the sun is moving through space, which means that if the sun's moving fast, the sun will have more energy. It'll get hotter. It'll influence the solar system, which means it'll influence earth. And if the sun gets hotter, earth gets hotter. That's a known quantity. Okay. And so then you have to actually ask yourself, what are the dynamics of the cosmos uh, at, in relation to Earth and, and to the sun? And uh, we'll start with the closest celestial object that we are 100% sure that affects the sun, and that is Jupiter. Okay, if, uh, if I remember correctly, and I don't have all the data in front of me, I'm just doing this as a freeform talk just to convey some concepts. But if I remember correctly, Jupiter is 75% the weight of the solar system. Okay, so that means that Jupiter, Jupiter weighs 75%, has the weight of 75% of all the planets in the solar system. So Jupiter is really almost the size of a brown dwarf in its own right. It's almost the size of a very small star by itself. Okay, so what that means is that Jupiter rotates around the sun about every 11 years. And because of Jupiter's mass, since it is the biggest uh, planet in the solar system, it affects the sun as it rotates around the sun. And I'm just mentioning Jupiter right now. I'm going to come back to Jupiter and explain how Jupiter affects the sun. But I just want to point out that the sun also has an 11 year sun cycle. How interesting. Jupiter has an 11 year rotation around the sun and the sun has an 11 year sun cycle. Is that a coincidence? No, it's not. I'm going to come back to that. The next cosmic calculation we need to make is the great year. Now, this is also known as the precession of the equinoxes, okay? And it takes about 26,000 years for Earth to go through this wobble. And when it does that, the stars, depending on how the stars are calculated and, and where their alignments are, it takes 26,000 years for this precession of the equinoxes to occur. Now, you can look into that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you definitely want to look into that. And I do believe that most people that are going to be watching this are familiar with these concepts. 
you need to have some basic celestial mechanics under your belt and you have to have some basic uh, astrophysics and even know about esoteric, some basic esoteric uh, concepts. Okay. But uh, so I'm, I'm not going to dive into the procession of the equinoxes, but what I will say is that there's a high probability that, that this wobble that the earth is going through is because the sun is in a orbit of some kind around either a binary by around another star that we can't see it could be a black hole or it could be a brown dwarf that's so dim that we we can't actually see it um or it could be just a general orbit within the star cluster that the sun is a part of because the sun is not just by itself it's actually part of a star cluster uh, it's it's part of a family of stars and all of these stars have to rotate around around each other in such a way that they don't wander off from their the, the from the star cluster first of all and second of all so they don't come too close to each other and uh you know if you've heard any of my other talks i talk about the universe being a, a crystal core quantum computer and all the stars and the planets moons protoplanets they are all naturally occurring crystal core quantum computers the takeaway from that, most importantly, is that they have intelligence and they are they are intelligent. So they're not just random rocks smashing into each other over and over and over again. They're actually very conscious of the way they're traveling through space. They understand that they have to stay within clusters and that they have to stay within the planets know that they have to stay within the, the heliosphere. Uh, you know, there's there's a well structured order to this. OK. Um, and even the definition of cosmos is literally the heavens and earth defined as a well-ordered whole. So, I mean, you know, there's obviously order to the whole system. Now, with that said, there is something that the sun is orbiting. We don't know exactly what it is. It could be a black hole. It could be a brown dwarf. Uh, it takes about 26,000. It could take about 26,000 years for the sun to make this orbit. Even if it's a, you might've heard of a Lagrange orbit. That means that it's not actually orbiting around the center of anything, but it's just influenced by all the other cosmic celestial objects within its vicinity. Um, it could be in this orbit where it just moves based on the movement of all the other stars within this entire cluster. There's this 26,000 year cycle that the sun goes through. That could be a possibility. So we're going to factor that in a little bit into our equations and then the next step that we have to look at is the great um not the great year that's the great year the, the procession of the equinoxes is called the great year above that what we know is the galactic year okay and so the idea is that where the sun is right now if it was to rotate around the entire galaxy just like earth rotates around the sun the sun is rotating around the galaxy the galactic year is 200 and 25 million years give or take a couple dozen million years okay so it's about 225 million years you could round it off to 200 million years either way it's it's at least 200 million years okay now going back to what i was talking about a little bit earlier motion of matter equals gravity which equals energy plus about 10 percent or just plus okay so we're not out to prove the plus part, even though we know for sure that there is an excess energy throughout the entire universe because the universe instantly was created out of a big bang where there was nothing. And then all of a sudden there was this huge expansion of energy and then the universe has been expanding ever since. That's not really the point of this talk. The point of this talk is that there is a consensus in the scientific community that the faster you move, the heavier you get, okay? And that's because there is a Higgs field or a dark energy field, or a zero point energy field, or the ether, or the prana, or the firmament, whatever it is, there's this field that matter is moving through. And as it moves through that field, it increases its energy. When it increases its energy, it increases its gravity, okay? And then there's a plus, meaning that there's excess energy produced by the very motion itself. Motion of matter equals gravity, which equals energy. If the galactic year is 225 million years, if you're looking at the galaxy and you're looking at your monitor screen right now and you imagine the galaxy moving from the left of your screen to the right of your screen, okay, and you're looking at the galaxy from above and the galaxy is rotating in a counterclockwise rotation, you can say at the top of the galaxy is 12 o'clock and at the bottom of the galaxy is 6 o'clock and if you're at the 6 o'clock position, if the sun is at the 6 o'clock position and it's moving in a counterclockwise rotation from 6 o'clock to 5 o'clock to 4 o'clock to 3 o'clock 
to 2 o'clock to 1 o'clock and then back to 12 o'clock. That means the sun is moving at the same speed. Not only is it moving at the same speed as the galaxy, but it's actually moving faster than the center of the galaxy because it has to get from the back of the galaxy up to the front of the galaxy, so it has to be moving faster. Okay, and so what we call that is we call that an upswing. And then if you look at the geometric properties of that rotation, you will notice that as you move from six o'clock, five o'clock, four o'clock to the three o'clock position, at about the three o'clock position, you're moving fastest within the upswing. And that is what we call a peak upswing. So in that point right there, that is where the sun will be getting the hottest because it's motion of matter, which creates gravity, which creates energy, plus about 10%. So that means that as the sun is moving through this field of energy, it gets hotter the faster it moves. And then the exact opposite is true. If you're at the 12 o'clock position, and then you're now rotating on the other side of the galaxy, going from 12 o'clock to 11 o'clock, to 10 o'clock, to 9 o'clock, to 8 o'clock, to 7 o'clock, and then to 6 o'clock. Now you're new, moving in a backwards rotation compared to the direction that the galaxy is moving. And that is called a downswing. That means that the, the sun is moving slower when it's in the downswing than it is when it's moving in the upswing. And when it's at the 6 o'clock and 12 o'clock position, it's moving at about the same speed as the galaxy, entire galaxy. So it's a neutral. Those two spots would techni technically be called a, a, a neutral zone where they're not moving faster or slower than the galaxy. You know, I mean, it's all relative. We've removed modulation from these equations. So we're, we're, we're removing a lot of the variables. We're just talking about broad concepts here. Okay, now... How I can prove this is because we have geological evidence of what's happening on planet Earth. If you look at the, the galactic year in the last billion years, okay, so remember the galactic year is about 225 million years. So if you times that by five, you're looking at about a billion years, okay? So in the last billion years, the Earth has gone through five major ice ages and five major extinction events. This actually gets into some esoteric areas and it even confirms parts of the Bible. I know, you know, I'm the last person who ever would have thought that I would actually be confirming parts of the Bible based on scientific theoretical calculations, but it's absolutely true. Okay, so in the last billion years, we've had five ice ages, major ice ages, and five major extinction events. The last five ice ages have each lasted about a hundred million years. Do you see a coincidence? The galactic rotation is 225 million years, give or take 25 million years. So just for simplicity and also factoring that six o'clock and 12 o'clock are ne neutral positions. Okay, so just, just bear with me. Let's just calculate, to, just to make things really simple, you know, the, the galactic rotation, the galactic year is about 200 million years and half of that time the sun is in the down position and we coincidentally have in the last billion years 100 million year ice ages. Every 100 million years there's a 100 million year ice age for the last uh, five rotations. And th is that a coincidence? No, it's not. It's because motion of matter equals gravity which equals energy plus about 10%, but that's not the part we're talking about. Motion of matter equals gravity, which equals energy. You can also equate that into just normal human terms. The faster you move, the heavier you get. The heavier you get, the more energy you have. The more energy you have, etc. Plus, plus, plus. In the last five galactic rotations, we've had 500 million year ice ages. And those are the exact duration that it takes for the sun to go from 12 o'clock to six o'clock. So that's the downswing. Okay, you understand? You, is that clear? Okay, good. Now, if you're at the six o'clock position, you're moving at the six o'clock position, you're probably starting to experience some melting. Okay, so let's just imagine um, we're at the 12 o'clock position and Earth is uh, relatively similar to the conditions that we're here experiencing right now. And then as it goes from 12 o'clock, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5 on that downswing to six, um, the earth goes into an ice age. And what happens during that ice age is everything freezes. All the moisture on the planet, it everything freezes. There might be a small point in the equator that doesn't freeze for 
certain periods within the downswing of the rotation, but for the vast majority of the planet, everything is in a frozen condition, okay? Now, there's something, another thing that I want to factor in, which I wasn't even planning on um, diving into, but I'm going to throw it in real quick, and I'm not going to elaborate too much on it. The water on planet Earth comes from the sun. I know, it's crazy. But what is water? Water, water is hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. It's a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. And what is the sun pouring out? Hydrogen and oxygen. The sun is pouring out hydrogen and oxygen. And it's literally the electromagnetic fields of Earth take the solar winds, which have particles of hydrogen and oxygen in them, and the magnetic fields literally grab hold of those particles and funnel them at the poles and literally dump the particles onto the planet. So if the Earth is in a hundred million year ice age, none of that water can evaporate the way it normally does. And you might have heard about the air glow. There's an air glow around Earth and there's this bluish greenish glow around Earth. Even at night, if you're on the other side of the planet, you can see the Earth itself is slightly glowing. That's, believe it or not, uh, chemicals, including hydrogen and oxygen, evaporating into space because of the heat of the Earth from the heating from the sun. Okay, so yes, the, the sun is constantly pouring water onto the planet. And depending on where the sun is uh, in this galactic rotation, uh, some of that water is constantly evaporating and being blown out into space. Okay, so there is somewhat of an equilibrium. Okay, but when you're in an ice age for 100 million years, all of the chemicals that are coming off of the sun, the hydrogen and the oxygen, and they're combining and creating water, they're not they're melt they're freezing but they're not they're not they're so cold they don't have the energy to 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 turn into um the very light gases and be blown out into space so there's more water accumulating on the planet when it's in a, a deep ice age so as the sun is constantly pouring out every second of every day billions and billions and billions of tons of uh hydrogen and oxygen the earth is trapping those chemical, those, um, elements and it's forming water. And that water is building up on the planet, primarily at the, at the poles. And as I said, there might be, depending on, you know, the dynamics and, and how far into the, 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 um, downswing at peak downswing earth for, and that's the peak downswing probably lasts at, you know, 30, 40 million years. The earth could be literally a giant ice ball with absolutely no liquid water whatsoever and you know or at least n none near the surface and so you know all of that energy and those chemicals from the sun are building up on the the the, the surface of the earth and then when the earth finally gets to that six o'clock point in the galactic rotation and it's now moving faster than it was and then it starts to move from the six o'clock position to say the five o'clock position. So now it's starting to move faster. There's a point where all of that ice that built up over the entire planet, it has to melt. And there's a high probability that when that ice starts to melt, because there's so much water accumulated, that the, wa the sea levels are much higher than they are right now. And you're talking about biblical flooding where the, technically the entire planet can be completely submerged in water now because we have mammals like horses and stuff like that that have actually um in the fossil records they think that some of the mammals actually went from the land back into the ocean my assumption is that there are some times that when we came out of a deep ice age and the sea levels were very high and all that ice melted and the sea levels rise rose drastically because we have animals mammals that have uh, gone from the land back into the sea i'm gonna just throw in this hypothesis that the reason why that these mammals did that was because the sea levels were so high but there was still some land so not all of the animals died and they were somehow able to over, you know, a million years, if you think about a million years compared to this entire cycle, a million years is not a long time. Over a million years, those animals were able to evolve from land animals back into aquatic animals, okay? 
And that's why we have whales and dolphins and manatees and these type of animals. Um, they call the manatee the cow of the sea, right? And so these, the, the scientists think that they were mammal, land mammals and that they went back into the ocean. And they don't know why they did that. So there's a possibility that, yes, we had biblical floods. And uh, there's a possibility that, you know, of the five times, at least one of them covered the earth so completely that there was no land mass whatsoever. But then again, you have to look at all the mountain ranges and you have to say, well, there is also a possibility, even if the sea level rose a mile, there's still a lot of land, you know, uh, there's still a lot of land that's higher than a mile, you know? And so there is, you know, there is that possibility. Anyways, those are just some things, those concepts that I wanted to throw in there just for fun. So now the planet is at the six o'clock position. It moves into the five o'clock position and um, it starts warming up because now it's starting to enter the, the upswing. It's not in the pink peak, peak upswing yet, but it's starting to enter into the upswing. So as it starts to enter into the upswing, five o'clock position and even the four o'clock position, what happens is the start, the planet starts to heat up and because the water, there's so much water on the planet, it gets blown out to space. Okay. Over millions of years, a lot of moisture is constantly bl being blown out to space, evaporating, and the sea levels are slowly rising until you hit an equilibrium where the amount of water that's coming from the sun and the amount of water that's being evaporated and blown out from the stellar winds and the, the, the temperature differential and the natural decay of all the elements on the planet and the, the heat of the core itself, um, creating this situation where these hot, 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 light, light, light elements rise and rise and rise up to the very top of the atmosphere. And that because they're so light, they literally get wisped away by the solar winds. And so then you have an equilibrium for a couple million years where the sea level and the land, the sea level basically starts to equalize. Okay. And we're in that position right now where the sea level, um, has actually equalized and if we look at geological records um it's actually been the sea level's been much lower than it has been um the sea level used to be four or five hundred feet lower than it is right now so i don't know exactly where we are in the cycle but the idea is that after the 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 um the the, the after the six o'clock and the five o'clock area and you have the great floods then what you have is you have a, a, a constant and perpetual slow heating of the planet as it goes from the five o'clock position to the four o'clock position to the three o'clock position. And at around the three o'clock position, you have peak upswing. Okay, so from the six o'clock position to the three o'clock position, you're still looking at at least about 50 million years. Okay, so within that 50 million years, you have the, 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 the planet warming up probably some great floods. And then as the sea levels drop and, equ and equalize for, you know, tens of million years, then you start to get to the peak upswing. And then what ha starts to happen is the sun starts to get hotter and hotter right around the four o'clock to three o'clock position. And as the sun gets hotter and hotter, even more moisture uh, evaporates off of the planet and the sea levels actually start dropping they start going down they don't go up they go down okay and as the sun is getting hotter and hotter the sea level is going down and down and down and uh there is a possibility that right at peak upswing the sea levels could either the sea could completely evaporate or it could um get very low but a lot of the because the earth gets so hot the core of the earth itself and all of the excess heat from the solar radiation literally heats up the molecules within the atmosphere. So all of this moisture and all of this atmospheric uh, chemistry gets so hot and it gets so light at the very edge of the atmosphere, at the top of the atmosphere. And so a lot of the chemicals get blown out into space and eventually they get blown out into the Oort cloud where they start to form up and create big snowballs out in the Oort cloud. Okay. Um, at peak upswing, the sun gets very, very hot and you have a Mars on Earth like situation for tens of millions of years. And then finally, the planet starts cooling down as it gets past the three o'clock position 
and it gets into the four o'clock, uh, I'm sorry, into the two o'clock, one o'clock, and then finally back up to the 12 o'clock position, the planet starts to cool down again. The sea levels do start to rise again because the chemicals that are pouring off of the sun um, are able to get trapped in the magnetic poles, get filtered down to the planet, and they're able to cool to a point where they're able to congeal, if you will, and not evaporate back out into space. So the sea levels could start to rise again. And then right around the 12 o'clock position um, to the 11 o'clock and even 10 o'clock position, we might not experience major cooling until we actually start to get back to the uh, to the to the uh, 10 o'clock and 9 o'clock position where then you're hitting peak downswing and you really get an ice age. So, you know, obviously these things are, the, the actual calculations are, they're very fluid, okay? The exact amount of time for the galaxy to do a complete rotation is not a perfect science. It's estimated to be about 225 million years. There's a lot of factors that could change that by many percentage points, okay? So it could be 200 million years, it could be 250 million years. There's still not enough data to truly know exactly how long that galactic year is. And also our carbon dating technology, which tells us how long the ice ages last, that is not a perfect science either. But basically you do have a consensus that about every 100 million years, you have a 100 million year long ice age. And the galaxy, for about 100 million years, is on a downswing. There's definitely a very, very strong correlation that these are related. So the motion of the sun through space dictates how hot and how cold it's going to get. We still have a little bit of time, so I want to talk about Jupiter. Jupiter is heavy enough that the sun and Jupiter are actually rotating each other. Jupiter is not rotating around the sun they are rotating each other. But because the sun is still so much more massive than Jupiter, it's affected very slightly in its overall trajectory compared to Jupiter. So J Jupiter definitely um, rotates around the sun, but there are points in the Jupiter-Sun relationship where Jupiter actually pulls on the sun and makes the sun move faster in its overall progression than it than it would normally be and then there's points in jupiter's cycle where it starts to pull on the sun and slow the sun down in its normal trajectory so there is a six year point where jupiter is increasing the sun's velocity and there is a six year point where the jupiter is decreasing the sun's velocity and then you have so uh you well it's it's five and a half years whatever it's about an 11 year cycle so jupiter's rotation around the sun is about 11 years so the sun has an 11 year sun cycle so that's two correlations that that line up to each other and so i mean you know you can pretty much say that you know we're talking about reality right now and uh, the Great Procession, a lot more information needs to be uh, studied, but there have been known to be a lot of small ice, ice ages between these major um, ice ages and between these major extinction events. There's been all kinds of different weather conditions that could be dictated by the rotation of the sun through its stellar neighborhood, okay? Through the, the, the stellar... Um, the uh the stellar um cluster that the sun is a part of that could also determine how fast and slow the sun is moving on its general progression through space which will make the sun get hotter and colder depending on those uh cycles and you're going to have many ice ages and you're going to have uh you know you could have uh a couple of dozen years where it's abnormally warm and then a couple of dozen years where it's abnormally cold and you can have these ice ages and then there's other factors cosmic factors to think about too you know um so that is uh, the talk that i want to present i will definitely try to um put together some graphics for you and uh i hope you enjoyed that if you have any questions put them in the comments below if you like this type of if you like this type of content feel free to leave me a thumbs up and if you want, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned. I will have more videos for you shortly. Thanks for watching.